Hello everyone and welcome to the historynetwork.org podcast. I'm going to kick straight off with another roll call of thanks for all the patrons who have kindly signed up since the last episode. Major thanks to F. David Calhoun and Larry Stein. Lieutenant General thanks go to Joseph Paduda, Kirsten Brewster, Lofcadio Darling, Vic Austin, Ian Ray and Richie Campbell. And Major General thanks go to Mark Bradshaw, Richard Wu, John Tyndall, Zvanta Lindholm, Gary Greenhalf, Woody Smith, Martin Bajer, Wayne Derwin, Craig Henderson, Brian Kinn, Doug Nipple, great first episode of the season again, Doug. Thanks again for writing that. Case Jones and Bill Mandeville. Apologies, A, for any mispronunciations there, and B, if you've made a pledge in the last few days and not been read out, these episodes are recorded a little ahead of time, but you will get a mention next time. Feel free to drop me a line if I did mispronounce your name, by the way, and I will correct it next time. Now, if all of that is a complete mystery to you, basically Angus and I have been thinking about what to do from season 26 onwards, as we've been doing this now for 12 years, and a lot has changed for us both in that time. So, we thought we would have a go at the Patreon route going forward. You can find out all about our Patreon campaign by heading over to patreon.com forward slash the History Network. There's even a video of Angus and myself there explaining things a little more, plus lots more blurb. Now, it might be worth mentioning right now, though, that this season, season 25, will continue to be delivered just as all its predecessors for free and an episode every couple of weeks. But one of the big reasons we want to have patrons on board from season 26 is because we now have a really good number of contributors, such as Doug, who I mentioned earlier, Simon Quinn writing for us for the first time, who has written this and the next episode, and also later in the season we've got another double episode from regular contributor Michael Gaby Gross. And there are lots of others of you, of course, who have written for us. And the thing is, we've never been able to pay anyone who's written for us before. But from season 26, if we get the patronage that we need, we want to be able to reward the time and effort that script authors put into making this podcast what it is, by being able to pay anyone who writes a script for us, which gets aired. So please do head over to patreon.com forward slash the History Network and see what we're thinking. Thank you. The History Network dot org podcast season twenty five episode three The French Campaign in Egypt and Syria seventeen ninety eight to eighteen o one. This episode was written by Simon Quinn. Simon is a postdoctoral research fellow in history at the University of York. He has recently completed a PhD studying the lives of British soldiers on campaign in Egypt in 1801. The French invasion of Egypt in the summer of 1798 was the first great seaborne invasion of the modern era, with 335 ships and almost 40,000 men, it was the largest seaborne force ever launched in the Western world, at least since Xerxes's vast fleet attacked Athens at the Battle of Salamis in 480 BC. It remained the largest ever seaborne invasion throughout the 19th century, only to be superseded in size by the Gallipoli landings later in 1915. It was commanded by the 31-year-old General Napoleon Bonaparte. At this time in his life his appearance was strikingly unimpressive. He was five foot three tall and painfully thin, with shabby long hair and a sickly pale complexion. His appearance contrasted with the pot-belly, stern face and receding hairline that characterises images of him at the height of his power. First coming to prominence at the Siege of Toulon in 1793, his career underwent a meteoric rise. 
His defence of the French Republic against a royalist uprising on the streets of Paris in October 1795 consolidated his reputation, and, after his campaigns against the Austrians in Italy in 1796 and 1797, he was hailed a heroic general. By 1798, the Directory, the executive power in France, was well aware of the dangers that the popular Napoleon posed to their authority. So when Napoleon suggested that a military expedition to Egypt would protect French trade interests and undermine Britain's control of India, the Directory asked him to lead the expedition. The idea bordered on fantasy, but it had huge attractions for Napoleon. French travelogues told of the degraded state of Egyptian society, and Napoleon believed it would be a walkover. The expedition also appealed to Napoleon's romanticism. He saw himself as a new Alexander the Great, forging a powerful empire for France in the Middle East. For Napoleon, the campaign made strategic sense, too. He believed he could strike more effectively at Britain through Egypt than by leading a hazardous invasion of the British Isles. Preparations began in spring 1798, as Napoleon secretly amassed men and provisions at Toulon. This imperialist venture was masked as a scientific enterprise. 167 French intellectuals, men of science, art and literature, were recruited for the expedition. They were to conduct research of all kinds during their time in Egypt. The order to depart was given on the 17th of May, 1798. After briefly stopping at Malta in June to raid the treasury of the ancient order of the Knights of St. John, the French arrived at Alexandria on the 1st of July. Although the French fleet was vast, Napoleon was aware that his flotilla was vulnerable to the Royal Navy. Having arrived safely at Alexandria, it seemed his fears were unfounded. In fact, he was luckier than he realised. Thirteen British ships under command of Horatio Nelson had been waiting off the coast of Toulon, watching the French preparations for the expedition. A storm had carried the British away from their station, and by the time they returned the French had set sail. Nelson's squadron sped across the Mediterranean to catch the flotilla. By chance the British ships under full sail cruised past the slow-moving cumbersome French fleet at night and reached Alexandria before the French. One can speculate how different European history may have been had the British discerned the enemy fleet in the dark. On seeing Alexandria practically deserted, Nelson thought the French must be heading for Turkey, and on the morning of the 1st of July he set off for the Anatolian coast. That same evening that Nelson set sail, the leading ships of the French flotilla anchored at Alexandria. The French quickly disembarked, breached the crumbling fortifications of Alexandria and brushed its small garrison aside. However, even at this early stage the French struggled with a scarcity of water. This was an indication of what was to come. Napoleon's lack of careful planning and his inability to appreciate the intense heat and shortage of water would destroy many lives. The primary objective at this stage was the occupation of Cairo. After a brief pause at Alexandria, the French set out across the desert to the mouth of the Nile, and from there marched upriver to the Egyptian capital. Unequipped for the desert crossing, the French army suffered horrendously from dehydration. There were a number of suicides, as those unable to cope with the extreme thirst shot themselves. This was to become a common occurrence during desert marches. When the French reached the Nile, a few soldiers drowned in a scene of grim irony, having thrown themselves into the river in a desperate attempt to quench their thirst. The French march to Cairo was opposed by the Mamluks, an ancient military caste of warriors who had ruled Egypt under one guise or another since the 13th century. The word Mamluk signifies slave or bought man in Arabic. In this case, the latter is closer to reality, as the Mamluks were not slaves in the ordinary meaning of the term. They replenished their numbers 
which fluctuated between 10,000 and 12,000, by purchasing boys from the Caucasus. These boys were subjected to a fierce disciplinary regime aimed at instilling warrior virtues. Once a Mamluk was old enough to command, he became a free man. Their training produced men who were invariably large, lean, muscular, and gifted in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They carried with them an entire arsenal of weapons on horseback and a fortune in jewels that were sewn into their clothing and encrusted in their weapons. The Mamluks gathered to confront the French outside the village of Mbabe on the 21st of July 1798. The ensuing battle has become known as the Battle of the Pyramids, although it was fought approximately ten miles away from the Great Pyramid Complex at Giza. It was here that Bonaparte allegedly said, Soldiers, forty centuries look down upon you. The battle has been regarded by some as one of Napoleon's great victories, and by others as a mere incident, the outcome of which was decided by the numerical superiority of the French. Napoleon commanded 25,000 troops. Opposing him was just 6,000 Mamluks, all of whom were mounted. Each Mamluk cavalryman had at least two servants or attendants, but these men can be excluded as they were not fighters. Napoleon had his men form infantry squares, the standard tactic when facing cavalry. In this combat formation, units formed a hollow square. Each side of the square was composed of two or more ranks of soldiers armed with muskets or rifles with fixed bayonets. The unit's colours and commanders were positioned in the centre, along with a reserve force should any side of the square be weakened by attack. Each side would fire volleys into the cavalry at a range of approximately 30 metres. It was very difficult to force a horse into a line of bayonets, and the Mamluks had little concept of an ordered and concerted charge that might have broken the French squares. When the order to attack was given, the Mamluks simply galloped forward as fast as they could, each man just as keen to be the first into the fray and intent on individual glory. They were dumbfounded by the seemingly impenetrable square formations of Frenchmen, and simply wheeled round their enemy, all the while under barrage from artillery, grape-shot, and small-arms fire. Wave after wave of Mamluks were cut down, and once it became apparent that the cavalry was having no effect on the squares, the Mamluks withdrew. The tactical superiority of the French seems evident, yet it depended entirely on the ranks' discipline. A moment of weakness or panic would have resulted in disaster for a whole division. Had they broken, the Mamluks would have penetrated into the squares and cut them to pieces. It is doubtful that the French were aware they had fought one of the most famous battles in history, but they were fully aware of having won a fantastic amount of loot taken from the bodies of the Mamluk fallen. The following day, 22nd of July, 1798, Napoleon occupied Cairo. Although victorious, his mood was downcast. He had just learned of his wife Josephine's infidelities in Paris. Worse was to come. At approximately 6 p.m. on the 1st of August, 1798, Nelson's squadron finally found the French battle fleet, anchored at Abukir Bay near Alexandria. Nelson had been recontouring the Peloponnesian coast when he learned of the French attack on Alexandria and promptly returned to Egypt. What followed was one of the most complete victories in history, known as the Battle of the Nile. As the sun was beginning to set, the French assumed the British would commence an attack at first light the following morning. Nelson had no intention of waiting, and signalled for his squadron to engage at will. The French were anchored in line, parallel to the shore, with their starboard broadside facing out to sea. When it became clear that the British were intending to engage, that evening the French cleared their starboard guns for action, but failed to prepare their portside guns. Several British ships simply cut between the French lines and the shore, attacking the French on their unprepared portside as well as the starboard. As each French ship was anchored, 
they were unable to assist one another. Carnage ensued as the British fired into the French ships from both sides at point-blank range. Vice Admiral Bruys, the commander of the French fleet, was cut in two by cannon fire on board his flagship, the massive 120-gun Lorient. He remained seated on the quarter-deck until he succumbed to his wounds. Nelson himself was seriously wounded when a large splinter slashed into his forehead. It was the latest in a string of severe wounds, having already lost an eye and an arm in previous engagements. By the early hours of the 2nd of August, the Royal Navy had utterly annihilated the French battle fleet. All thirteen French ships of the line were either destroyed or captured. Although several of the Royal Navy's ships were seriously damaged, all remained afloat and in service. The Lorient was destroyed by a catastrophic explosion when a fire reached the powder magazine at 11 p.m. In the following days, a huge shard of Lorient's main mast was removed from the bottom of Abakir Bay by one of Nelson's captains, who had it carved into a coffin for his commander. It would later be used to inter Nelson at St. Paul's Cathedral in 1805. The destruction of the French fleet changed the strategic situation. Napoleon's army was cut off from France and could expect no further reinforcements or supplies. Moreover, the result of the battle encouraged the Ottoman Empire to declare war on France. Once this became known in Egypt, the situation appeared helpless. Napoleon was undaunted, and he embarked on a flurry of activity to consolidate his control of Egypt. A detachment of 3,000 men under the command of Louis-Charles-Antoine Dessay, one of Napoleon's most trusted generals, was sent after the remainder of the Mamluk forces who had retreated into the desert south of Cairo. Meanwhile, Napoleon founded a learned society in Cairo, the Institute of Egypt, modelled on the Institute of France in Paris, where he discussed plans for the modernisation and enlightenment of Egypt with the 167 academics he had brought with him. He also took a mistress, Pauline Four, the wife of a cavalry officer. He made no attempt to keep the liaison secret, and was well aware that word of this would get back to Josephine in Paris, which was doubtless what he intended. Napoleon's primary efforts were directed towards integrating his army with the locals. He knew he could not control Egypt by military force alone. It so happened that two of the most important festivals in the Egyptian calendar, the feast celebrating the flooding of the Nile and the feast commemorating the birth of the Prophet, fell less than a week apart in August 1798. These celebrations provided a pretext to demonstrate the friendship between France and Islam. They were celebrated with great pomp and circumstance by the French. Although sources are contradictory, it appears at one point that Napoleon planned to attend the ceremony of the Prophet's birth in Arab dress. Earlier at dinner with his staff, he had appeared in this attire, but was greeted with bursts of laughter, which prompted him to remove it. In spite of these efforts, Napoleon could not sway Egyptian opinion. Although he was careful to show respect for Islam, he and his army were not Muslims, and remained infidel invaders in the eyes of Egyptians. This hatred resulted in sporadic acts of violence against the French, particularly in rural areas where their control was less secure. At El Mansura, 80 miles south of Cairo, a garrison of 120 Frenchmen was massacred shortly after occupying the fort there. In Cairo, the growing discontent among the Muslim population contributed to the homesickness among the French garrison. This feeling was heightened by the disappointment at the sights and the amenities offered in Cairo. The French were blind to the city's more beautiful or historic features, and instead bemoaned the absence of conveniences that Parisians took for granted. 
By October, the population in Cairo was well aware of the Turkish Sultan's declaration of holy war against the French. It proved a catalyst for the Muslim inhabitants, and a vicious revolt broke out at Al-Azhar Mosque, one of the largest in Cairo. Although the insurrection was rapidly and bloodily suppressed, the French were left under no illusions about the locals' hostility to the occupation. The discontent in Egypt was far from Napoleon's only concern. Encouraged by Ottoman support, Jezar, the Pasha of Acre, began amassing troops on the Egyptian border and sent incursions into French territory. It was clear to Napoleon that a major attack was coming, but he refused to wait and launched a full-scale campaign into Syria to eliminate Jezar. This campaign may not have been as impulsive as it seemed, as it was designed to follow in the footsteps of Alexander the Great. In this regard, it is significant that Napoleon brought many of the academics with him to Syria, copying the example of Alexander, who sent back to Aristotle samples of flora and fauna his expedition found on their way to India. This imitation of Alexander's practices allowed Napoleon to fashion himself as a new Alexander. We will be continuing to look at the exploits of Napoleon in Egypt and Syria in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks again to all you recent patrons. If you haven't yet, then please go and have a look at patreon.com forward slash the History Network to see what Angus and I are thinking of doing from season 26 onwards. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast, written by Simon Quinn, read by Nick Barker. Mm-hmm.